thank God that we have someone we can call on and he answers us.
Welcome, we're so glad to have you with us this morning and we pray that you had a super wonderful Thanksgiving time with friends and family. We pray that you uh, really were able to sit back and remember and be thankful for all that God has done for you this year. Uh, even, Even though it was a difficult year, I think that we can all find those ways and those things that God has gotten us through that we can thank Him for. Uh, as we uh, celebrated Thanksgiving this year. Today, we are excited to be back in our series on the life of Noah, and we're going to be studying the eighth chapter in Genesis today. We're going to be really focusing in today on how God comes in and brings deliverance now to Noah and his family. The word deliverance, it means the action of being rescued or set free. And I want to really just spend a moment talking about deliverance because Uh, truthfully it's a word generally speaking I don't think that we use very much in our culture today I think uh, most of us we like to be self-sufficient and self-made people that we don't want to be rescued and we even when we need help we don't want to ask for help right and so in general I think the idea of deliverance is something we tend to avoid or even uh, on a worst case scenario look down on people who need deliverance and yet, you know, we, we really shouldn't have that viewpoint in general. So we're going to look at that today and why. Listen, among Christian circles, you hear the term deliverance maybe a lot more, especially in certain circumstances. I mean, there are some ministries that are even known as deliverance ministries, and they really major on the fact that people always have something they need to be delivered from. And so they kind of major in helping people through through problems and circumstances in their lives. Uh, I think in some ways we often complicate things when it comes to some terminology and we make it sometimes maybe a little bit over-spiritualized or under-spiritualized and so we don't want to use them and we're afraid of it. And so listen, the aspect of, of really deliverance when it comes to the spiritual side of things is not just a theological concept or here's how, what oftentimes we we do is we minimize deliverance to speak of some kind of transaction that takes place that God does in our lives. Rather, it's something quite more intense than that because really deliverance is a very personal, loving God coming into our lives to rescue us from something that really we can't do on our own. And God comes in and he turns our lives around. And so there's a very personal aspect to deliverance in our lives with God that even as Christians, we can overlook. And, and so it's very important in our lives. I believe that throughout our lives, there are different things that we go through that we need deliverance in and that God is really an important part to that and we need to look to God for our deliverance. And so for many of you today, maybe the thing that you need deliverance from is you need healing in your life and you need to be delivered from sickness or disease or maybe even chronic pain or something like that in in your life that's going on or disease that is plaguing your life and you need God to come in and, and do a miracle in your life. And I'm praying that God gives you the faith and the strength you need uh, through today's message. And for others of you, it might be something like provision. I mean, I know this has been a tough year for many people. Some of you, you've lost jobs, or others of you, you're in jobs that aren't quite paying the amount of money you need, and so every month you come up short, right? And so you are experiencing a lack of Uh, of what you need and so you are in need of God's provision you're in need of God to deliver you from a lack of provision and so today I believe God wants you to find strength and faith today maybe for you it's relational Uh, I just know so many people in my life who are single right now and truthfully you want a family and you're frustrated with the, the spot you're in right now, and you're asking God to deliver you from your singleness and giving you uh, a relationship and a family to have of your own. Others of you, it's still relational, but it's, it's just that there is relational conflict going on in your life, and you need deliverance from that, either from God to remove a person from your life or to restore that relationship into something that 
is right. And so you need a sense of deliverance. And I'm, I'm once again just praying for God to give you the faith and the strength today to walk through to that. And so really what I'm, I'm praying for as we enter today is just God to show up powerfully and to deliver us in the ways that we need deliverance in our lives. And so as we kick off today, would you just pray with me uh, as we enter into this message? God, I just pray for people where they're at. You know the circumstances of their lives, the things that they're going through, God, and the areas where they need your touch and your rescue and your provision to come in and deliver them from their circumstances, God. And I pray as we walk through today's story of the life of Noah, that you would increase our faith and that you would give us the strength we need to trust you and to walk through the deliverance you want to bring to our lives. And I just thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, as we walk through the story of Noah and God's deliverance for Noah, I, I want us to really see God in how he brings this process of deliverance to Noah. Not so much so that we can kind of put God in a box. Because one thing I think is you study scriptures, you begin to find out that, you know, God never really healed the same way twice. And what he does is he meets people at their personal level, and, and his healings and his deliverance are on a personal level and a personal scale. And so this is why we don't see, I think, God repeating uh, patterns. It, because otherwise we put God in a box, and so we would really do that with him. And the truth is, is that he works individually with us. And I think the same is true in the area of deliverance as it is with healing for our lives. And so what I don't want to do is put God in a box as we walk through Noah's story of deliverance because our lives are not going to look exactly like they look with Noah. But what we do find, I think, is some principles of deliverance that normally I don't think we look at of how God brings us through to deliverance. And I think we don't look at some of these uh, processes very often in our own lives, and, we, we, and they're very important. And so I think this is why studying the story is so important because there's some principles here that we need to learn to apply to our lives. And so th now listen, as we get into this, I, what I want you to see is, is the story. We, we're already been in the story where we see that God said, I'm going to judge the earth with a flood. And so he, what does he do? He sends the rains down. He has Noah first actually build the ark. Noah and his family get into the ark and the rains come, the floods come, and all of the people are wiped out. And Noah's floating around on the ark, and we come to this very first verse in, Roman, or in Genesis 8, verse 1. Look what it says. Then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him on the ark. I just think it's appro appropriate that we find right here in the story of Noah this really important concept that happens, I think, in our lives personally. And that is this. We really often feel like God forgets us when we're going through struggles. I mean, don't we? And why does it feel that way? Uh, quite frankly, it feels that way because it's taking too long for God's deliverance to happen. I mean, think about this in the context of the three examples that I used in the beginning where we're struggling with our health. And many of us, we're, we've been struggling for a great deal of time, right? And so that struggle is real and there's a time factor that, that is really part, that plays a part in our lives. And we feel like God has maybe forgotten or, or again, our financial situation. You know, we've been struggling for months or if not years and we're just wondering, when is God going to deliver me from this? When is this time factor going to be dealt with? Or again, in relationships. I mean, for so many of us, it's a time factor. I've been single for many, many years. Or, you know, this relational conflict has been going on for way too long. And God wants to step in. And the question is, is when is God going to step in and, and, and deal with it? It just feels like for many of us, like God has forgotten us in the middle of the mess we're we're in. And that is the issue. And it must have been really, think about this, what Noah was going through and what he might have felt and thought as he's sitting on this ark for so much time. I don't know if we connect what Noah must have been going through because, again, we read the story fast. You know, the floods came, the waters rose, Noah's floating on the boat, then the waters recede and Noah gets out and that's it. And like we we read it fast and we get to the end fast and we know the end, but we don't 
we don't get the details. We miss the incredible truths in the details that we need to know. From the time that Noah got onto the ark to the day he got off, was seriously, it was over a year. It was over a year time. Three, it was like 377 days or something like that before he gets off the boat. And, and yet, if we go by the text of Scripture, there's two significant things that I want to explore today that we might overlook. And the first part is, is we're going to look at here, and it's this, that the last time that God is recorded speaking to Noah is, Noah, get on the boat. <laughs> and then the next time we see God speak to Noah is, Noah, get off the boat. And so there is this long period of silence from one point to the next. And the, this is maybe what I think many of us feel as we go through our lives is like God, you know, he talks to us and then there's this period of silence and we're wondering when is God going to speak again? And it feels like we're forgotten in the middle of all of this. And it's important for us to understand what it means when God says he remembered Noah because it's not like God was like got busy with something else and all of a sudden he looked down on the earth and he's like, oh, there's the ark and it's just floating around. I, I forgot. Maybe I should do something about this. There's nothing to do like that. It's not like us where, you know, we walk into the next room and go, why was I here? And we just had a thought a moment ago of why we came to that room. And, and it's not like God forgets like we forget. In fact, when it says that God remembers in the Bible, this is what it means. It means that God is about to take action on what he has promised to do. Listen, I want to give you a few examples of what we see when God remembers in the Bible to show you how true that is. Let me give you the first example. It's, it's uh, the story in Genesis chapter 19 where God is going to come down and he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And God says he remembers, he remembers his promise to Abraham. And because of that, he goes down and he spares Lot. Okay, that's where, where it is. He remembers his promise to Abraham. Recently, we looked at the story of Joseph in the Bible, and we talked about how Rachel couldn't have children for so many years. And, and this is what it says and records in Genesis 30, that God remembered Rachel and she conceived. And that's when Joseph was conceived. In Exodus chapter 2, we read about the Israelites, and they're groaning under the oppression that they're facing in Egypt and, and the, how Egypt is oppressing them and, and forcing them to be slaves and, and really taking advantage of them. And this is what it says in Exodus chapter 2, that God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, Christmas is coming soon. And we're going to be celebrating the birth of Jesus. And in the New Testament, when Mary finds out that she is pregnant with child, she erupts in a song of praise to God. And look at what he says in Luke 154. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of of his mercy. Okay, she immediately connects the remembrance of God's mercy to her conceiving the Son of God. One more, the thief on the cross requests this in Luke 23, 42. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And again, the appeal is for God to remember because when God remembers, that's when he is going to begin taking action on the promises that he's given. And in every instance, God is the one that moves to then change the situation and bring about his plan. What does that mean for you and me? What that means for you and me is that God, if God has given us a promise, then he will not forget. And I want us to really understand this because we need to be clinging to the promises that God has shown us and not letting go of them. Because if God promised it, then he is going to deliver. And guess what that also means? It also means that when God has made the promise, it's not because, the, the, the waiting time is not because we're not doing our part. The waiting time is us saying, God, I'm going to trust you that your timing is right and you're going to do it. Because in every instance, it was not up to the people to make it happen. 
It was really waiting on the promises of God to finally come in and change the circumstances. And so in the meantime, what we're called to do is rest and trust in God. For Noah, it goes on to say this in verses 1 through 3, And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the water subsided, and the fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were also stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained, and the waters receded continually from the earth. And at the end of 150 days, the waters decreased. Decrease. I don't know if you know the significance of this, but the flood did not disappear in a day. I mean, really, that's the way we want things to happen, but it didn't disappear in a day. And in fact, it says that God started blowing a wind on the earth, and that over the process of 150 days, the earth began, the waters began to recede. And so I want you to think about that. It took 150 days for the waters to even start receding. This is roughly a half a year that took place before that Noah had to walk through patiently waiting for God to do this, okay? And God began the process of deliverance. And even though that pro- he began that process, it took a great deal of time before the fulfillment of this promise came to happen and comes to pass, And he starts that, though, before he even speaks. The winds start blowing. And I'm sure Noah woke up one day and he realized the wind's blowing. But he didn't know really what God was doing. But he could sense that God was doing something, that he was bringing about a change in the midst. Remember, God, he, he is the one that does this. And just because he is silent, it does not mean that he is absent. His silence never means his absence. And many of us, we need to remember that and remind that and encourage ourselves in these things. And I told you that there's a second significant part to the struggle and really that Noah finds himself in and and that we see in this, this text. And it's really this, that last week we looked at God told Noah what? Get on the ark and seven days later it's going to rain and then it's going to rain for 40 days and 40 nights. And that's all Noah really knows, okay? And so he only knows that he's getting on the boat and he's going to be on there for roughly 47 days. After that, he knows no more of God's plan, at least that we can see in Scripture. And so every day, Noah wakes up wondering, when is my deliverance going to come? When's it going to happen? Is it today? Is it tomorrow? Is it the next day? He has no clue. And even though his deliverance is taking a long time in coming, Noah holds on in hope to God for his deliverance. He never loses sight of it. In fact, Noah anticipates God's deliverance still. And as we go through the process of waiting for our deliverance, I think one of the biggest struggles we have is is really we get discouraged and we lose hope in the midst of waiting so long for what we believe God has shown us to be true in our lives, the promise of deliverance that is coming. And we lose hope and we lose sight of that. In fact, Scripture says it this way, that there's this little tension here because Scripture says in Proverbs 13, 12, hope deferred makes the heart sick. And to defer something literally means that it's postponed. It doesn't mean it's canceled. And I think that's the struggle is is because it's delayed, we think it's canceled. And God didn't cancel anything. He never cancels his promises. But they're deferred sometimes. They're delayed. They're postponed. And it's challenging in those times of postponement when we're waiting and we want something now to not lose hope and to not let our hearts grow sick. And the challenge is, is how do we maintain hope in those situations? How do we keep our hearts from growing sick in those times where we're waiting because the promise of God is postponed? This part is not always the easiest to walk out, yet it's really a very important part in the process of this. We anticipate our deliverance from God by looking for signs that he is moving. You and I have to begin to do that. Instead of what happens actually for most of us is that our focus is only on the promise, right? It's only on that part being fulfilled. It's never on the process of what God is doing to move things in position so that that we're set up for those promises to take place. 
And so Noah, what he does is he doesn't necessarily look completely to the end of the promise. He's actually just looking for the process. God, I just want to see you're doing something. Show me something that you're doing. Because if you just show me a little glimpse that you're still moving in some way, shape, or form around me today, then I can have hope that you're going to bring about your promise of deliverance into my life. But I must see that you're doing something even today. And so isn't kind of the question that we kind of have is, is what is God doing, right? Or, or how is, when is this going to end? In Genesis 8, 6 through 12, we have Noah. He sends, out, he sends out these birds and he sends out a raven and he sends out a dove to basically test and see some sign from God that he is doing something. And so the raven goes out and doesn't come back. And really, quite frankly, that's, should have been a no-brainer that that was going to happen because ravens are scavengers and they'll they'll pounce on anything and eat anything that they can and so i'm sure the ravens just flew away and began to see dead carcasses around and just started pecking away and floating on on dead carcasses until uh just for whenever so it had no need to come back okay and so but noah didn't just end with the raven he sent out a dove and doves are clean birds and so the doves fly away, and the first day that it's sent out, it flies to and fro, and it doesn't find anywhere to land, a clean place to land, so it comes back to Noah. Instead of Noah getting frustrated, he waits seven days, and he sends the dove out again. And this time, when the dove comes back, there is an olive branch in its beak. Can you imagine the hope that filled Noah's heart when he just saw a little bit of a glimpse that there is a tree alive somewhere out there, even though I can't see it, there is a tree out there that's budding and, and bearing a leaf. Suddenly there's a hope that God is bringing his deliverance. His deliverance is coming. It may not be here yet, but it is coming, and I have a sign that it's coming. And so the, then he wakes up another week, and then he sends out the dove again. And this time the dove does not return, and no one knows that the the dove, if it didn't return, it found a clean place to land and to take off living again. So here's what he does. And let me bring this back to us because, listen, do you see how this plays out in Noah's life and how it's meant to play out in our lives? I don't know what it might be for you, what the sign is that you might be needing for God to give you the hope you need as you walk through your circumstances. But I'll tell you, there needs to be some way that we begin to pray and seek God's face so that we begin to see signs of his deliverance so that we don't lose hope. Often for me, it's simply getting into God's word and asking, God, show me a scripture verse just that I can hold on to for today that can encourage me, that can strengthen me, that I can know that you're moving in my life. And oftentimes, God has exactly what I need in a scripture verse for the day. Other times, I've asked God to show me that he's moving in a situation through either another person or another circumstance. And God often will bring a person or a circumstance into my life to show me and to reveal to me that he is moving in, in a special way. The key is, is that we're looking for God to show us that he's moving. Even when we don't hear his voice speaking to us, we're still looking, God, show me that you're moving in this situation so that I don't lose heart over the promise you've given me. Now, you would think that the moment that Noah saw land, the promise of his deliverance, that he would have jumped out of that boat and began swimming to the, swimming to the land and getting there as fast as possible, but we don't see him do this, right? And I think there's an important lesson in this, that, that Noah still waited even when he saw the land. Listen, when I did landscape work, oftentimes we'd have to mow those retention pits that are, are really covered in grass. And so it would look oftentimes like, like oh, it's dry and we can go mow the lawn. And, and so we'd go down there with our lawnmowers and inevitably there'd be times where immediately we'd get down there and we'd get stuck. Why? Because I'll tell you what, ground that has been saturated in water is a soggy messy, messy, messy thing, okay? And it will, it will really get you stuck. 
And so Noah, if he would have gotten out and swam to the land at first sight, even though it, it might have looked okay from a distance, but once he would have stepped on, he would have been stepping into a, a mud-soaked area, and it would have been a mess, right? And it, wouldn't, it was really no good to do anything until that land actually dries out a little. And what I want you to understand is the important truth here is that sometimes we see our promise from a distance and we're like, okay, instead of waiting for God to say, now's the time to go, we jump overboard and we try to take hold of it ourselves. And what we do is we mess it up. What God meant to be perfect, we make a mess out of. And so here is something that we can learn from Noah in. And so in verse 15, God finally speaks. And look what he says. Then God spoke to Noah saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. And I think right here in this part of the story, we often overlook an important truth that really might have been going on in Noah's heart and life. Because really, once we finally get what we hope for it can be a scary moment think about noah for a moment in a way that maybe you don't normally think about in the past it had been a long year for noah on this boat and certainly there were things that he probably hated i mean it's cramped quarters he's with you know he's he doesn't have his own space he's with his three sons and their families He's with all these smelly animals, and, and then really there's just no place to stretch out his legs. The ark is cramped. He probably really couldn't realize what, what, what life would be out like without it, and there's an element where he would want to leave this ark, right? But on the other hand, I want you to think about this. It was the ark that really saved his life from the destruction he did see and all the people around him. And so there was a saving element to this ark. In fact, when it rested on the ground, when he looked out at the land, it probably looked nothing like he had ever seen before. Everything that he had known in the past was completely obliterated. It was gone. Life would look completely different. And so nothing looks the same, and getting off the ark means starting a new life. And really, in a lot of ways, you might have gotten used to your routine and safety of the ark and all that changes the moment you step off and you know that look and listen the truth for you and me is that our lives never stand still i mean we really are never the same from today to a year from now you're going to be a different person you're going to have different views of things and experiences but we are constantly changing and adapting just to make it through the things in life that we're going through. We've, most of us have experienced that this year, right? I mean, we've changed and adapted in so many ways than we ever would have thought was possible as we've walked through the challenges of this past year. And so leaving things and experience the deliverance that we hope for means leaving all of that behind. And in many ways, that can be a scary thing. Listen, right before Jesus healed a man once, he asked him a question that in many ways seems rather cold. He says this in John 5, 6, do you want to get well? I mean, think about that. Here's a sick person in front of you, and you ask the person, do you even want to get well? I mean, how absurd is that? And yet it was a very important question that Jesus asked because, listen, this man had been sick for 38 years and just every day his routine was go lay by the pool of Bethesda. Go, go lay by that pool, right? Or the pool of Siloam. Go lay by there. And every day he would be laying by there. And so here you have a man who's stuck in routine. And so the question, do you even want to be healed, was meant to really cause this man to think about the changes that would have to take place in this man's life the moment that healing took place, the moment he was delivered from all that afflicted him. On one hand, what we hope for finally comes, but with with it comes a complete disruption to everything that we have really created to be the safety of our lives and our routines. And so that is what deliverance really brings. And the question is, just do we really want what we say we want? Because many people choose to stay in the ark because even though there is a lot to complain about there, it's safe. 
Yet I will tell you this, it's not where God intends for us to live. It's just not. If we leave the ark, we begin to step on new ground and experience an opportunity for new life. And it's the moment we step onto that ground, I mean, can you imagine the joy that would fill your heart? We see it in Noah. Immediately, the very first thing that Noah does is he goes and he builds an altar and he sacrifices to God and he rejoices in God's salvation. I mean, there's just a, a recognition of thanksgiving in his heart. And really, that is always the response of deliverance. The moment we step into the deliverance that God has brought to us, there is an in- intense sense of joy and rejoicing in who God is and what he's done for us because he is the one that stepped into our lives and delivered us and rescued us from something we know we could never do ourselves. And so there's Noah building an altar and sacrificing to the Lord and his heart is filled with thanksgiving. And I think it's appropriate that as we just celebrated Thanksgiving that we know that a thankful heart is a big part of finally receiving the deliverance we have longed for and hoped for for many years. Listen, as we close today, I want to show you one more thought. Because the greatest thing we need deliverance from is our sin. I mean, some of us know that and some of us don't. But listen, apart from God, if we're standing in our own sin, we have only, only hell to look forward to. But God has promised deliverance and he sent his son jesus to die on the cross so that we might be redeemed and saved from our sin and so i want you to see because throughout the story of noah we keep seeing how god is serious about judgment right we keep seeing how god is serious about one day we're going to stand before him and one day judgment is going to come and he's going to wipe out all that is wicked and he saves noah because he is God has put his righteousness on Noah. And Noah becomes righteous because of what God has done in his life. That is what we see as a pattern in the life of of people. Is that no one is good, no, not one. That's what we find in Scripture. But God comes and he reveals to us the truth of his salvation. And we, by faith, receive his grace into our lives and we're saved. Now listen, throughout the story of Noah, what we find is incredible details of how God meticulously tells us how he saves and what he's doing in the life of Noah and his family. And one of the particular details that we get in in so many ways is dates. And one of the details God shows us in chapter 8 is specific dates of God and what he's doing in the life of Noah and how he's delivering him. This account gives us the perfect control and plan that God has through this whole process in how he brings about his promise to Noah. And what I want you to see is when God remembered Noah, it wasn't just at that moment when Noah receives his deliverance. It happened way, way, way before that. In fact, it happened way before Noah even existed because it goes all the way back to just creation and how God created the earth and how much water was on the earth and above the earth. And it had to be just the right amount of water that completely could flood the whole world. And there had to be just the right amount of water for that to happen. And then for it to recede and to be able to go back into all those places. There had to be just the right amount of wind blowing against Noah's ark and literally moving it to where God wanted it and intended for it to be. There had to be just not only the right amount of time or the right amount of wind and the right amount of water receding, but the right amount of time for God to put it exactly where he puts it when he does. Because we're told in verse 4 that God moved moved the ark to land on Mount Ararat on a very specific day. And it's the 17th day of the seventh month. And it's rather significant because God records it exactly this way. And then what we find is thousands of years later on this exact date, do you know what happens? This is the day 
that Jesus is resurrected from the dead. On the very same day that the ark lands on Mount Ararat. If that wasn't enough, the word Ararat means the curse is reversed. And so on the same day that the ark struck the ground and landed on the mountain, the curse is reversed. That's what it means, okay? And, and what we see is on the day of the resurrection of Jesus, the curse is reversed, right? And Jesus rose from the dead, defeating hell and death once and for all so that we might be saved and we might know the truth of salvation. And only God could meticulously put that in the story of Noah and then bring it to pass in the life of the Savior of the world. Noah and the, and the ark is a picture of the true reversal of the curse that God was bringing through his son Jesus thousands of years after this. And we read in Galatians 3.13 that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, becoming a curse for us. And so right here in the story of Noah, we find the story of Jesus once again. And it is a beautiful picture. And what I want you to understand today is that that if you are steeped in your sin and you are in need of God's deliverance from your sin and and to receive the salvation that Jesus has from you, today is the day of your salvation. Today is the day for your eyes to be open and for you to see that Jesus is the Savior of the world, that he can become your Savior personally and there is no greater gift than we can receive of deliverance than we can receive as in salvation and my prayer today is that you would receive that today as we close and would you just pray with me if you want to receive jesus into your life today let me just ask you to pray with me jesus i confess that i'm a sinner god and god on my own my sins i could never pay for them They will destroy my life. But through Jesus, the Savior of the world, God, you promised that I could have deliverance from my sins, that you would redeem me from the curse of the law. So right now, today, I receive Jesus into my life as Lord and Savior, and I thank you for the grace that you have given me. And from this day forward, God, I want to turn my life to following Jesus every step of the way. God, may today be the day of new life. And God, may I I literally, my heart and life be filled with joy as I step out into this new ground and this new life you have for me. From this day forward, I want to live and honor you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you prayed that, would you just let us know? We would love to connect to you and to pray with you. Uh, and to give you the next steps in following Jesus and even give you a Bible. And so reach out to us at our website. We'd love to connect with you. Before we go to a time of worship, though, and, and celebration and then communion, I just want to just pray for those who maybe right now are watching and, and really, you're just, you need deliverance in some other area. Maybe for you it's healing. Maybe again for you it's financial Maybe again for you it's relational. Maybe it's something else completely. Maybe, maybe it's an addiction you need a deliverance from. God is a God who will deliver us. And I just want to pray that God would reach down and stir the faith in your heart today so that you can receive the deliverance he has for you and not lose hope as you wait for that deliverance to come to fruition. For some of you, it's going to be immediate. And for others of you, for whatever reason, it's going to be a process. But either way, may our eyes be on Jesus, who is the one that can only change our circumstances and our situation. And so I would just love to pray with you right now. Jesus, I pray, God, for every person who is in need of deliverance, God, whether it's for addiction, whether, Lord, it's for relationships, whether it's for, God, financial or healing in their health, Lord Jesus. We know so many are sick. Lord, right now with with sickness and disease and with this COVID virus, God, may you bring your deliverance to the hearts and lives of those today who need that and bring faith to begin to trust and to continue to trust and hold on to your promises that God you are a God who hears and remembers Lord and Lord when you remember you bring action to bring about your promises into our lives and I pray that you would be doing that right now in the hearts and lives of those who are watching today God 
Lord, thank you for answering our prayers that we give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for praying with us. If God does something great, please let us know. We would love to connect to you again and we'd love to hear a testimony. So feel free to write us on our website. But let's worship God together and then we're going to come back and we're going to take communion. And so we invite you to prepare your hearts for communion together. We thank you, Lord, that we can cast our burdens on you, Lord. We don't have to stress. We don't have to worry, God. Because you have this, Lord. You understand our needs, God. Carried a burden. I've carried a burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go. I see it now, I'm laying it down, and I know that I need you. I run to the Father, I fall into grace, I'm done with the hiding, a reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend, so I run to the Father again and again. You saw my condition, had a plan from the start. Your son for redemption, the price for my heart. I don't have a contact for that kind of love. I don't.
mountains, mountains are still being moved. Strongholds are still being loosed. Believe today, God, we believe. Yes, we can see it. The wonders are still what you do. Bodies are still being raised. Giants are still being slain. God, we believe. Yes, we can see it. The wonders are still what you do. We are here for you. Come, Lord, come and do what you do. still being raised. Bodies are still being raised. Giants are still being slain. Yes, Lord. God, we believe. Yes, we can see it. The wonders are still what you believe today, church. Oh, we are here for
we come to our communion time, we are reminding ourselves each week just of how much we need Jesus and the work that he did for our lives and that we can't do it on our own. And in the area of deliverance, I know it's, it's so true that we're, no, we just can't, we can't do it on our own. We need God to step in and his power and his might. And so as we take communion together, I want you to really think about Jesus in the work that he did on the cross for our deliverance, for our healing, for our wholeness. The Bible says, on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. And after the supper, he lifted up the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. It is the blood that's been shed for you and for the forgiveness of your sins. And every time you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup together. Jesus, once again, we are thankful for the work of your son on the cross that by your stripes we are healed, God. And I thank you for that healing touch and that healing power. May it flow to our hearts and lives in every area of our lives to make us whole in you, Jesus. And I thank you that you are a God who loves us so greatly, Lord Jesus. This isn't just a transaction. This is a loving God who we just, Lord, have to worship because, Lord, we are amazed by you and your love. We thank you for that. We worship you today. We praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship God with one more song and I'm gonna come back and give a blessing. Again. 
Well, again, thank you for spending our weekend with us and our services, and, and we just are praying again that God blesses you and delivers you from the things that you're facing today, uh, and I'm just excited to hear about some of the testimonies God is going to do in your lives, and we, we again encourage you to let us know those things, but let me pray a blessing. We look forward to next week as we wrap up this series in Noah. And so we invite you to be back with us next week. We'll be both online and in service next week. So we welcome you to be a part of it. But let me pray a blessing and we hope to see you soon. But may the Lord bless you. May God keep you. May God make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may God grant you his peace. Amen. God bless. Hope to see you next week.